الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على محمد وعليه وصحبه وسلم إن شاء الله we're going to continue from where we left off we are studying in this book uh, سورة الفاتحة from the تفسير of Sheikh Abd Rahman bin Nasr al-Sa'di رحمه الله and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayat he said وقاتلوا في سبيل الله الذين يقاتلونكم ولا تعتدوا إن الله لا يحب المعتدين. يعني he said after that وقتلوهم حيث تقفتموهم وأخرجوهم من حيث أخرجوكم والفتنة أشد من القتل ولا تقاتلوهم عند المسجد الحرام حتى يقاتلوكم فيه فإن قاتلوكم فقتلوهم كذلك جزاء الكافرين فإن انتهوا فإن الله غفور رحيم وقاتلوهم حتى لا تكون فتنة ويكون الدين لله فإن انتهوا فلا عدوان إلا على الظالمين So the Sheikh he said here that the, these noble verses are a decree for discharging jihad and fighting in Allah's cause when the Muslims gain strength after their migration to al Madina. Allah imparted on them the consent to fight. Whereas prior to this, they were ordered to refrain from fighting. This is a great benefit, great wisdom. When you don't have the power to fight those uh, who fight you, and those actually who transgress the limit, you don't fight them. Because they will crush you. And they will destroy every, everything. So you don't have the power to fight them. So you have to wait until you gain strength. So the Sheikh he said here, fight with the phrase in Allah's cause is a persuasion for Muslims to be sincere. To be sincere and abstain from quarreling and argumentation amongst each other during periods of turmoil. Look, subhanAllah, there are two benefits. The first benefit is you are sincere. You're doing it for the sake of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the time of turmoil, when there is, you know, turmoil and um, chaos and the like, the Muslims, they should not split among each other. They should not split among each other. And that's what happened to Muslims in Andalusia, Spain. You know, Muslims, they ruled Andalusia, Spain for 750 years of Islamic civilization. But because of the turmoil, and fighting among each other, you know, they became weak. So they lost, they lost everything. They lost everything. So the Sheikh he said, Rahimahullah, those who fight you means fight against those who are preparing to fight against you. It is in reference to the young and healthy disbelievers who have the ability to fight you. And not the old and the feeble who can neither fight nor give military advice to the enemy. So it's, it's not everyone. Look how the Sharia, subhanAllah, uh, this law is so beautiful. It's full of wisdom. That we don't fight those that who, are, who are old and those who are feeble and the like. You fight only those who are capable of, and healthy, and young and healthy from the disbelievers. And prohibition to not transgress the limits includes all actions of cruelty and oppression, such as killing women, children, the insane, and the priests who do not partake in the fighting. So these individuals, we don't, you don't, we don't touch them. Look how Islam is so beautiful, subhanAllah. You don't know, like some, uh, in, uh, some fighting, you know, people, they kill everyone. And this is haram. You don't kill everyone. Killing, uh, he said, uh, Rahimahullah, cruelty and oppression also encompasses disgracing of the dead who were killed during a war. So you don't take their body and mutilate it. This is haram. It's not permissible to do. Killing of animals and cattle without any valid reason. Cutting down trees and things of a similar nature because they are all forbidden as they do not bring any benefit to the Muslims. 
If the disbelievers agree to pay the prescribed jizya, you know, the, the, the protection money that they give to the Muslim government, that's called jizya. If they agree to give that protection money, then to fight against them would also be considered as cruelty and oppression. So once they give that money to the government, to the Muslim government for protection, then you leave them alone. You don't fight them. You do not fight them. And is therefore forbidden. And then he said, kill them wherever you find them. In a particular commandment that decrees the fighting and killing of disbelievers. And means to fight against them defensively and offensively through the ages. Whenever and wherever they are found. However, proximity to Masjid al-Haram excludes from the generalization of this verse because fighting in it and around this mosque is strictly forbidden. However, if the disbelievers start a fight near the Masjid al-Haram, then it would be permitted to resist it, to resist them. This is because they were the ones to instigate this fight. And they should now face uh, the... <clears throat> The, uh, the, and their oppression and tyranny. This fighting and jihad against the disbelievers shall continue until they repent from their di disbelief and embrace Islam. When they do so, Allah will surely accept their repentance despite their prior disbelief in Him. But look, subhanAllah, how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the disbelievers accept Islam, and they enter Islam, everything that they have done in the past will be forgiven. Everything. And another benefit also, all the good deeds that they did in the past, they, will get, they get to keep those good deeds. SubhanAllah. They get to keep those good deeds. So if they gave charity, or they did charitable work, or something like that, that is good, then, uh, inshallah, they will keep that, those good deeds as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anfal, قُلِّ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِيَّنْتَهُوا يُغْفَرْ لَهُمْ مَقَدْ سَلَفْ Say to those who disbelieve, if they cease and they stop, and they accept Islam, everything that they have done in the past will be forgiven. They had performed the gravest sin, disbelief, within the boundaries of the sacred mosque and prevented Allah's Prophet وسلم, and the faithful from entering it, this permissibility to defensively fight is from Allah's extreme kindness and benevolence upon his servants. Since prohibition of fighting near Masjid al-Haram creates a, a false impression that such a fight might be a cause for mayhem in the sacred city, Allah makes it clear that performing the sins of idolatry and preventing people from practicing Allah's religion is far worse than fighting their, their, therefore. Muslims, there is no harm for you to, in fighting them. This verse offers supportive evidence for the famous principle among Islamic scholars that a person should choose the lesser of the two evil when it comes to to absolutely necessary to choose an evil. And I know we spoke about this in the class last night. If you have to choose between two evil situations, then you choose the one that has the lesser evil. For example, if uh, someone, for example, a brother, he saw a sister, you know, on a bus, He's just, you know, got into the bus, and then the bus took off, and she's going to fall from the door of the bus, and she might get killed or something like that. So in that case, should this brother, who is a non-mahram to her, should he catch this sister from falling, or should he let her fall? Well, which one? He catch her. Don't, don't say, well, it's haram. I cannot uh, touch a woman. And then you let the, the, the woman die or get hurt. La. In this case, you catch her. 
Likewise, when you see someone, you know that you know. If you stop them from an evil, they will do an evil much worse than that evil. You don't stop them at that time. And uh, there is a story about Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. Sheikh Muhammad bin Utaymin, he mentioned it. Sheikh Islam, rahimahullah, he lived at the time of the Tatar. The Tatar. The, who, who are the Mongols. The Mongols, right. Because you know the Mongols, they ro- ruled India as well. And also... They, ra- they ransacked Baghdad, the city of Baghdad. They killed scholars. And they destroyed a lot of Muslim civilization in terms of knowledge. So much so that uh, the Euphrates River and the Tigris, one of them was running with the ink from the books, the Islamic books, and the other one was running of the, from, uh, with the blood of the scholars. So they com- committed a lot of atrocities. But they accepted Islam later on. But during the time when they, were, they, they occupied Baghdad, and I want you to reflect on this, because we're talking about this principle that the Sheikh is mentioning here. It's very important that we shed some light on this principle that the Mongols, they were drinking alcohol. They were drinking alcohol. And Sheikh al-Islam, rahimahullah, with his students, they were walking around. So the students, he, he wanted to go and stop them from drinking. Then Sheikh al-Islam, he told them, no, let them drink. Sheikh al-Islam, he used this principle right here. And then he told him, them drunk, them being drunk is better than them being sober. Them being drunk is better than them being sober. Because when they become sober, they're going to kill Muslims. And killing Muslims is more of an evil than them drinking alcohol, right or wrong. Yes. So we have to, you know, understand the Sharia and also use this principle in cases where you have to deal with two, you know, evil situations. And we, we give an example, another example. Last night, if you are in a situation where you're starving and if you don't eat, you lose your life. And you are like, for example, in the middle of the desert and you can't find anything to eat. No vegetables, no fruits, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing to eat. Nothing except dead meat. And you have a choice either to eat from a dead carcass of a pig and a dead carcass of a cow. The ulama, they say you eat from the cow. You eat from the cow. Because the cow is a less of an evil than the pig. And then you can use this qaida, this principle in uh, other situations where you have to choose between two evil situations, but one is less of an evil than the other one. The Sheikh said, so that the bigger evil may be eradicated effectively. After, afterwards, Allah explained the goals of participating in fighting and jihad in his cause. Fighting in Allah's cause is not just for shedding the blood of the disbelievers. That's not the intent behind it. And taking their possessions as spoils means ghanaim, spoils of war. Rather, its sole goal is that worship is solely for Allah. That is the reason. So that everyone will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the, the mushrikeen, they worship idols. They worship idols. And now when they worship idol, uh, they are missing the point of this creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِعَبُدُونَ And I did not create jinn. 
and human except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're defeating the purpose of the creation by worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh said, to achieve superiority of Allah's religion over all other religions and faiths and to er eradicate idolatry, ibadat al-awtan, idolatry. And subhanAllah, it's very strange. These idols, they can't even speak to them. And people worship them. Atheism, which is uh, ilhad. In Arabic, we say ilhad. And you'll be shocked even in Muslim countries now. Some of the people, they have become atheists. Yes. And other such theologies from the earth for good. This is because they are all against Allah's path and are the real reason for uh, the turmoil on earth. As soon as these goals are achieved, it becomes forbidden to continue fighting. That's it. If they desist, meaning if they refrain from fighting against you near the Masjid al-Haram, then let there be no hostility except against the oppressors. You must not oppress or maltreat anyone except those who actually commit oppression. The punishment for oppression must be equivalent to the crime and not to exceed. You see, when someone commits a crime, they are to be punished accordingly. We don't over punish them and exceed the limit. La. It has to be according to the crime. Inshallah, we're going to stop right here. We we'll finish the, this ayat. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all beneficial knowledge and righteous action. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Barakallahu.